Hello, my name is Dmitry, and I wanted to share some of my thoughts on some aspects of the kernel. So first of all, who am I? Um, we started working on user space, sanitizers, fuzzing, hardening, and about approximately five years ago, we thought maybe some of those tools may be useful for kernel. Um, I'm not the most active developer in the kernel. I contributed to some of the debugging tools, did some fixes. Uh, you may also know me because of the syscaller and sysbot, so I manually reported uh, more than 500 bucks, and then sysbot reported more than 2,000. So, and this gave me quite unique perspective on some of the aspects of the kernel. And when I started working on the kernel, I started noticing things, and things that looked kind of wrong. Um, and those can be roughly qualified to two buckets. One is related to bugs, quality, security, and testing. And the second one is development process, tooling, experience, satisfaction. <clears throat> so bugs. Uh, whatever way you look at this, there are just too many, right? The fixes tax we have 9,000 per year, which is significant percent of commits, and we know that less than half of fixes actually have those tax, so it's actually more. And Sysbot reported several thousands of bugs, uh, it's like several bugs each day. And actually, the thing is that fuzzing is not supposed was not supposed to find that many. It's not supposed to find simple bugs and completely broken subsystems. And we we'll, uh, still cover only small part of the kernel, and we are finding only crashes. So we don't actually do any logical checking. So we don't do testing in this sense. And we still don't detect some classes of bugs. So it's also not, not a complete number. And now it's not getting better over time. We kind of have roughly consistent flow of bugs over two years. And also collected a number of very interesting bug stories. Uh, how the whole subsystems in the kernel were broken for you know, four releases, so more than one and a half years. How subsystem became broken and stable. How critical vulnerabilities were introduced into stable. Um, I've also seen people literally saying, I'm afraid that kernel developers will fix bugs because they will fix the bugs, but then they will break my functionality because nobody will run any tests. I've seen distro people saying that um, it's, it's not possible for us to keep up or like, monitor what happens in the stable just because there are too many things. And also Greg says that CVs don't work. So the useful process that works for other projects is not working for the kernel because we have that many bugs. The stable releases. So the stable is something that doesn't change frequently, right? So I look at the number of changes actually in the stable. Um, and for 4.9, it's more than 13,000. And 4.19 is kind of less, but if you look at the number of commits per month, uh, it's actually now at almost at 400 <laughs> per month. Change. I would like to say that stable doesn't mean that it's not changing much. I mean, it means that it doesn't crash. It's no bugs rather okay. than no changes. This is also a questionable statement. Okay. But so for 4.19, uh, it's 700 per month. So it's literally, for the last years, it's literally one per hour. Um, and we know that there are lots of non-backported fixes. There is a number of bugs that are kind of known upstream and not yet fixed even upstream. And there are thousands of bugs that we didn't yet found upstream. So based on this, I can conclude that every kind of looks good and stable release we produce contains at least 20,000 bugs. And no, this is not OK. And it's not getting better. right? So if we would be fixing bugs just a little bit faster than we're introducing them, that we would be kind of at, at zero, right? So we're introducing them at this rate as well. <coughs> And it's even worse. So as you know, nobody actually uses the kernel.org tree. Everybody has a fork, right? Each device typically has a fork. And for most practical purposes, each fork of a bug is effectively a new bug because somebody needs to backport the fix, review a fix, you know, test the fix, and so on. So for example, at Google, we <clears throat> fix a bug in one kernel, and it doesn't magically fix it in all other. And how many are there? I think I can say at least 10,000. We're just looking at all of the devices out there. So if we multiply 10,000 bugs by 10,000 forks, it now gives us 100 million kind of bugs or work items we create for the industry every time we produce a kernel release, which doesn't look kind of good. So security, security suffers. Like lots of those bugs are exploitable. We see bugs 
you know, in the network code, in the USB, KVM, <coughs> and not even touching on the local, local access. Uh, and uh, the thing is, is that there's no consistent effort to ensure some kind of a base level of quality for almost any subsystem. There may be few exceptions, but generally it's not the case. And most of the work we are doing is mostly reactive, right? We, we get a bug, we fix it, but we don't even ensure that this bug will not reoccur next week. I'm not even saying kind of ensuring some area around this bug. And security usually requires very explicit proactive work. Yeah, so we need to fix lots of bugs, and people asking me like how we can make more of the sysbot bugs fixed, but and not that I'm opposed, but unfortunately we're just fighting the consequences, right? The inflow of bugs is so high that we fix five, but at that time 10 are being introduced. So until we reduce this inflow of bugs radically, uh, fixing majority of the bugs is, is, is intractable, and tracking security issues is intractable, and producing stable releases is intractable. So this is for the bugs, for development process, like patches are being lost, including patches for important bugs being lost for years. Patches are hard to apply because you don't even know the base tree for any patch. Patches are hard to send because you know this, you need to set up email, you get corrupted patches. Patches are hard to review because you don't have context, so you miss bugs on the error pass, which you simply don't see in the patch itself. Uh, you can look at the uh, div between versions of the change and your comments are lost between versions and so on. Bug reports also being routinely lost. Uh, there is no tracking of the review to the patch, patch to the bug and so on. <clears throat> and kind of transparency is not perfect. Like sometimes people don't know like who, who, who is going to take my patch. Sometimes it's taken by several people and what is the status of my patch is kind of the eternal kernel question. And we also have different rules for different subsystems. Okay, and because of this, developer satisfaction may suffer. So it's kind of hard to quantify objectively, but when, you know, you, when your work is lost or when you duplicate work with somebody else or when you have to redo your work or when you feel completely lost because you just don't understand what happens and like, who, whose action is next on the patch, when you have to struggle with the tools, when you get you know, late reverse, uh, reverts of your commit, when you have inconsistencies, when you're forced, effectively forced to break things and don't have a means to ensure that your functionality will not break next week. Uh, it kind of make effect satisfaction. People may be asking itself, uh, themselves question if I want to send you know, another patch which I strictly don't have to send. And lots of those can be directly attributed to the kernel process and the tooling. And developer productivity also suffers. Like all of the works on the bugs that could not be introduced, right? Including debugging, fixing, review, apply, pull, back port. Uh, it could just not happen. Like and fixing the same bug twice sometimes happen or reporting the same bug twice or lo loss, um, when we lost, lost the patch and then somebody needs to redo the work. And even spending time of such things as uh, reviewing code formatting and basic style, it's something that you know, people in other projects don't do today already. Um, also reposting your comments or trying to run tests or trying to understand if the test is passed or not. So I suspect that kernel developers could be like twice as productive if most of those would be addressed. And some of those problems may be partially neutralized if you're kind of, for a long time in the kernel, you work mostly on a single subsystem, so you kind of know the rules, you have some scripts, you know how to run tests, so it's kind of became slightly better for you. But those all, all, all of those problems are in full effect for newcomers, for drive-by fixes, when you're doing some work in, not in your home subsystem, when you're doing some cleanups or refactorings. And the thing is that we, we absolutely need all of those people, all of those, uh, fixes and contributions for the long-term health of the project. Yes, and most of those things are kind of not rocking science today, like having test, pre-commit testing, tracking changes, like most of the, lots of the projects are doing this today, we kind of know how to do this. Okay, so this is kind of the problem statement. So then I try to understand why this is happening, what is the root cause. And initially I couldn't understand because if you look around and like, is it that there is no test and no, there are some tests and people start pointing you at different tests. 
maybe there's no testing, it's also false. There are you know, several efforts to test the kernel. Uh, we have some tooling, we have right, patchwork, bugzilla, we have some processes. Maybe nobody cares, also not true. Like if you talk to somebody, everybody agree that those are the problems, we need to fix them. Maybe you simply don't have resources and also false because if you look around, I can count at least 50 people working on you know, testing, tooling, static analysis and other similar things. So we do have those resources. Maybe we just you know, need to do some more incremental improvements at a few tests here and you know, do some few, few more improvements to patchwork and then everything will become perfect. It also doesn't feel that that, that would be enough, right? So we can have all of the pieces that we need, but still yet it's all not kind of working for some reason. <clears throat> and then I started realizing that maybe the problem is the fragmentation. And by fragmentation, I mean multiple effort to do the same things, multiple you know, solution to the same problem, lots of them kind of not you know, isolated, not talking to each other. And the uh, opposite of that would be consolidation. Is that's when we have single solution to a single problem, single effort to solve a single problem. So let's look how it affects testing, for example. <clears throat> so just if you're not in the, in the area of testing, so testing is super hard. It's not just, you know, run the test. So, uh, for, um, so you start with onboarding test suits. That's a whole lot of work. People literally spend engineer years on this. And then enabling, uh, deploying some debugging tools. That's also not simply flicking, flipping a config, and most of the CIs, for example, don't even have KSN enabled today. Uh, <clears throat> then you need to build you know, web interfaces, reporting by section, pre-commit testing, static analysis, make developers be able to reproduce your bugs outside of your CI, collect core dumps, and if you have hardware, that's a whole new set of problems that you have. And in the end, you just need to you know, maintain this uh, system and make make it running, so, which is already kind of full-time job. And I, I'm not even touching on the kind of premium features like testing developer patches or producing coverage reports. So I can estimate it approximately maybe 50 engineer years doing like most of those things in some, you know, basic form so that the testing is actually functioning. Um, and which looks a lot, but the thing is that we already spent that menu, actually spend more than this. But the thing is that we spend it on like seven ass assorted efforts. Uh, so all of them did lots of the exactly the same things. <clears throat> some of them did bisection, some of them still don't have bisection, and some of them have say, better, better bisection, some have worse bisection, and doing something in one of them absolutely doesn't help the others. And this problem is hard enough to solve it in, even in a single copy, but trying to solve it seven copies of it, of it is just doomed to fail, and it's failing so far. <clears throat> but it's actually even worse, because the, besides the, this duplication, the, the fragmentation of the kernel, kernel tooling and the processes makes it even harder to implement testing, because we have, you know, all the test suits are completely different. Uh, and then if you want to do pre-commit testing, you need to intercept patches, which is extremely hard to do. Um, report, reporting results is even harder in the kernel, and we have lots of kind of human interfaces, uh, which makes it very hard to automate anything, right? Um, and it's even worse. So let's imagine we actually seven CIs kind of succeed and actually start testing the kernel. Then developers get seven copies of bug re each bug report for each bug, right? And probably within a week because they will, some of them will have different latency. And you'll actually need to reply to all of seven of them because if you don't reply on one, another developer may, may start fixing the same bug looking just at the different report where you didn't say, I am working on this, right? And so CI people will be will just think that you maybe lost their report. <clears throat> also, uh, we see a significant problem with Sysbot that developers need to learn how to actually interact with your system, how to work with your system. So this is very hard even for one system, but if we, if we have seven copies, then it will be just impossible. Uh, lots of them depend on kind of either one person or a small group of people within a company. 
So if say what, that one person is on vacation, then sorry, we didn't get that part of the testing. And uh, lots of them considered kind of personal efforts, so they're kind of not part of the kernel. They, um, you know, this, uh, so nobody wants to contribute, right? Because this is the kernel and this is, you know, this is your thing, like this, this is not the kernel's testing, this is Dmitry's testing. Why would I consider, or wh why would I contribute to it? <clears throat> so I think that fragmentation is why we can have nice things in testing and actually make it properly functioning. And if you look at the development process and tooling, then we also have fragmentation, right? So all rules for subsystems are different. Obviously, there's no documentation running tests for each subsystem is completely different. You can spend literally days and you will not necessarily succeed. Uh, then we have email, patchwork, GitLab, GitHub, Garrett. We even have Git versus Killed. We have lots of local scripts running on uh, some local machines of people. And currently it's not possible to avoid this fragmentation, right? Because nobody have kind of powers to make something that their solution, kind of the single way of doing things. So if you want to improve something in your subsystem, you're forced to, you know, create this kind of isolated island where, you know, you do this things this way now, but like nobody else uses this. And besides fragmentation, some foundations are simply missing. For example, we don't have such a simple thing as user identity. Uh, and it's required for lots of automation. <clears throat> for example, we can have a system that will do something on your behalf simply because we can, you know, say who is that you, right? And we can have a um, uh, system with sh shared responsibilities because we can't express w what is that group of people. Right, and we also don't have change identity, so if you have two trees, you can't really say what well, if this change in the other tree is like not possible. Uh, we don't have base tree commit for changes, we can map code to tests and so on. And besides that, we have lots of literally English oriented interfaces. Uh, <clears throat> so people say reply to patches, apply it, which means that the patch is applied, but sometimes they reply with apply it, but that actually means something else. Or they say NAC or no way NAC, but they also say NAC handling needs to be improved, which literally comment on the code in the patch. So if you try to kind of treat this, what, what is the meaning of those commands, it's like, you know, you can do this. Yeah, so humans are smart and machine are dumb, so we need to make, give them a discount. And if we have um, interfaces that are easy for machines, easy for automation, that are also trivial to represent this in a nice way to humans, right? But it's very difficult to do it the other way around. And as a result, because of this fragmentation, missed foundation and English-oriented interfaces, it's become super hard to build anything on top of this. So the feature that is mentioned frequently is like, you, you mail a change and CI adds a test passed tag on your change. And I think it's required to you know, prevent lots of bugs being introduced in the kernel. But building this feature becomes super hard in multiple dimensions because you know, just everything is against you. Things that should be just no problem at all, for example, on GitHub you can just get a notification about new change with the, you know, this is a change, this is a base tree, you can you know, get the exact source code. Uh, in the kernel it becomes super large problem. Uh, there's also no sense of collective ownership for lots of things, so we have it for code, right? If you fix something over there, you don't consider that you contribute to somebody else's code, right? You, you consider that this is your kernel, which is a great thing to have. But for lots of other parts, like testing, static analysis, tooling, we unfortunately don't have it. Uh, uh, and the thing is that useful practices need to be shared and common, <clears throat> because simply because a single person cannot, you know, uh, you know, address some problems. For example, consider we do all commit messages like fix a bug, uh, and then Linus says, hey, you know, I think it would be useful if you actually write proper commit messages, you know, and explain what we're doing. And we say, yeah, sure, that's a great idea. So you proposed it, so now you go and add commit messages to all of our commits, right, because it's kind of your idea. Or you propose to add comments to the code, so now you go and add comments to all of our code. Right, it, it can work this way. And we need it for, for example, for fixing, flaking, and failing tests. 
as well, because currently it seems to be, you know, the, the only people who care are people who run CI. <coughs> yeah, then we have overloaded maintainers, who seems to be forced to do too many things manually and invent kind of own process and automation, obviously with no docs. And the group maintainership, as far as I understand, is still not kind of a real thing in majority of the subsystems. And it's, it's hard to implement, right? Because we can't even express identities of people. <clears throat> and for the, <clears throat> I think that w the only thing that maintainers should do is review the code and kind of stamp it for inclusion into the kernel. <coughs> I'm not sure what else they should be doing that is not automatable. Uh, it's definitely not, you know, not copy pasting text, not fixing mangled emails, not suggesting to run check patch or it's signed off and probably maybe even not sending pull requests. Because if you say, you know, I approve this needs to go into the next merge window, that should be enough. <clears throat> okay, so let's try to imagine a better world where we actually have, you know, consolidation and we have some foundation so that the blocks nicely fit together and we have interfaces that are suitable for automation and because it's easier to build, we actually have much more of it and we have less duplication and we have more of a collective ownership and more of a group maintainership because it's much easier to implement. <clears throat> and all subsystem get all of this goodness for free, including documentation, because there is just single copy of the documentation. And as a result, we also have more consistency. Yeah, so we, let's imagine an even cooler feature. For example, if you get a warning from a zero day bot about the compiler warning, Right, what you do, you go to console, you check out the branch, you double check the file name, the line number, open it, find the line, try to figure out what's wrong, you know, fix the, fix the, the code, save the file, build, realize that you made some mistake, you open the file again, fix it again, save, build, okay, write the version, uh, different version one, and then save, send the new version. Where what we could have is actually a static analysis tool post your comment and say, you know, here is something wrong and you should, you should have this code and you say, you know, agree, apply this, that's it. Or we maybe could have, you know, stable patch trash queue where we actually look at each patch and decide if it goes, needs to go to stable or not. And <clears throat> obviously it needs to be sharded to be, to be practical and also with the help of some automation that will pre-triage lots of things. For example, if the commit has uh, fixed a stack, it goes to yes. If it, uh, if it is a comment only change, it goes to no. And so maybe it can be sharded across maintainers as well so that they should suggest what, what is the, should it be included or not. And large scale changes. Imagine you change thousands of files in the kernel. Also, you, you made the change using some semantic code analysis tool. And then what you do, you just give it to a system and say, go submit it for me. And the system splits it into patches, finds the maintainers for each patch, finds the tests, run the tests. If the tests pass, it mails the change. If maintainers approves the change, it merges it. Only if the maintainer leaves a comment, that's where you kind of need to take an action. And this may sound a bit like a, you know, fantastic world, but such system actually exists for years and greatly helps to manage a very large code base and kind of improve developer productivity and more importantly, affect things that developers actually want to tackle in this, in this world. Uh, so they don't look at the problem and just say, oh yeah, this is probably worth fixing, but you know what, I don't want to spend two next two years of my life on this. So I will probably just not do this. You know, with, with the help of the tooling, they can, they can be excited to actually do, do such large changes. <clears throat> okay, and obviously consolidated testing where we have significantly less duplication of work, where, where things are easier to implement because we can rely on the lower level kind of services, and where tests are much easier to run. And ideally you just say, for example, run net filter tests like single common, like whatever it takes, you know, figure out the config, build it, run and give me a pass fail or run a uh, test for that file, which I touched. I actually don't know what it is, but I touched it. So run the test. And if the test passed, then that's all I need to know. 
<coughs> so that's what's required for CI. That's what CI is doing, but it's kind of currently not possible to you know, make it available for, for actual developers. So we'll have more collective ownership and where people actually don't mind contributing to those things because that's considered you know, the, the, kernel, the kernel effort rather than somebody personal thing. And also all of the changes have much higher return of investment. For example, if you deploy a dynamic tool, it immediately kind of affects all of the kernel testing. <clears throat> and where it's possible to do breaking changes, what happens today, uh, people do some change and it breaks all of the tests and, and it's kind of simply, currently it's not possible to avoid this current, not possible to do kind of graceful rollout of any breaking changes. And also test machine scalability is something that lots of people mention. So the kernel testing may require lots of resources. And if we have a single system, at first it's much easier to get res more resources for the system. And the second, we again, we do not duplicate effort because what happens today with, with the resources we have, we run all of the same tests on all of the same commits say five times. And we can, may even get maintainable code. So if I contribute some functionality, um, yeah, so if, if, we, if we have tests that are easier to run, uh, to write, and they're actually executed, people may start seeing benefits of this, and we may have maintainable code. So if I contribute some code to the kernel, I will not need to be around for eternity because I'm the only per person um, who knows how to test this code. Right, or maybe it will be possible to touch some parts of the kernel without breaking them because all of the tricky thousand, you know, corner cases for this code are actually encoded in the tests now. Okay, so it's easy to speculate and easy to draw those, you know, perfect pictures, but is it the right thing to do? Uh, so I think it is because the scale dictates optimal amount of unification and commonality that is needed for a system. Uh, Larger system needs more unification structure to be manageable, and if we, we have quite a large system with uh, not enough of structure and rules, and we kind of losing track of the things. But you may say we don't like imposing things, right? But I think this is at this point this is actively harmful for the project. And second, we actually do we do uh, impose lots of things. We have lots of common things like C, GPL, Git, code style, you know, tags and the commits and other things. And if you think about each of them, each of them tremendously helps the project. Uh, for example, if you take one of them, say Git, uh, I think it will break lots of things because there are lots of scripts and lots of kind of systems that assume that it is Git and they're built on top of this foundation. <clears throat> but so this, those things provide quite basic level of services, but the problem is that on top of this, we have you know, complete anarchy, we have fragmentation, we have you know, missed things, we have you know, human-only things, and so on. So I think we are kind of long due to actually having more of the unification on the higher levels. And one indication of that is I looked at the full help for the Git command, and uh, you can find pretty surprising things that it can do. So it's kind of version control system, but it can send emails, so why it is sending emails. Or it can parse some files that are extracted from emails. Again, why, why version control system is doing this. Or it has functionality to man manage kind of record-based database in a plain text commit messages. Again, like why? Uh, so the answer is that that's just the only common denominator that we have, so if you want Anything in the kind of in the kernel process, you have to push it into Git, right? But we obviously can't have issue tracker and I don't know testing support in the Git. Probably that would be a bad idea. So I think we are kind of stuck in a local optima, and current answer for any problem in the kernel is like you do small steps, and the thing is that we can get away out from this. <coughs> The thing is that no amount of small steps will get the Linux as a project away from email-based process. Right? It's actually even worse. So people try to do some improvements. Say they try to switch to GitHub, GitLab, Gerrit, or you know, run another local script. And this makes situation better locally for them, but it actually makes 
situation worse for the whole project because we have now even more fragmentation. <clears throat> so what I think we need to do, we kind of need to make a step back and look at the final destination where we want to be and try to make kind of fourth step to, you know, to better Optima. <clears throat> yeah, because we have a structural systematic problem and it can be solved simply by, you know, some number of local fixes, local improvements for structural problem, you need a structural solution. <clears throat> so now the last question is how, how we can, how we can get there, and what exactly is the action plan? And I don't have precise answer, first of all, because it's a hard problem. Second, I don't simply tell all of you what you need to do. So I think we need to kind of discuss and, you know, try to come up with a solution. I have some ideas about implementation. So first of all, I think it needs to be, if we are doing this, it needs to be very explicit effort. We need to understand that we're, you know, creating the new, the kernel way of doing things that will be used everywhere. So the worst thing that can happen with, with this is if this will be tried to be downgraded again to the same, you know, you propose that you try to do something, you know, over there and, you know, we, we're, uh, and then the, the, the best outcome is that it will die. The worst outcome is that will, it will only increase fragmentation even more. So second, I think it needs very explicit buy-in from leadership, including Linus, uh, because the current distributed kernel community, it's very hard for it to kind of self-organize for, for such large radical changes without explicit leadership, because again, nobody has any powers. And the second implication is that uh, then leadership will need to ensure everything they can to actually to make this effort a success, including kind of changing the direction on the way to ensure that it actually arrives to the necessary destination. It may need to use working group approach simply because discussing all things on the mailing list with you know, 5,000 people may be not the most productive thing. Uh, some of the Changes may need kind of a carte blanche approach, uh, just simply because uh, that may require lots of changes. And if you need to, you know, kind of justify and argue on each small change with everybody, it may be just become unfeasible to do. I don't know if it needs to be a left project. I don't know, maybe, but companies will need to donate some people for this. And the thing is that companies already spend in significant amount of resources. It just currently they spend not in the most efficient way, I think. So it just kind of, the idea is that they repurpose their resources. And the question is if the, this can then benefit the companies, you know, testing and processes, because say lots of distros do, you know, own testing, they have own tooling and so on. So it would be natural to kind of be able for those companies to also reuse significant part of this, right? Because they donate the people. Obviously, it all needs to be open source and probably not this kind of single web system deployed by a single company thing. Also needs to be incremental in multiple uh, dimensions, um, kind of in the features as we implement them, but also in unification. So the first step may be to have several uh, kind of fragmented thing just be unified uh, and the single interface to the higher level and to the lower level. So this kind of fragmentation becomes local within a single block rather than kind of global and affecting the whole system. And the subsystem also as, as, as they switch to this new, new tooling, it also needs to be incremental. Initially probably switch one of them, then maybe a few more. It's just important to understand that we're switching all of them rather than stopping after you know, three or five. Yes, and last thing. So recently, Konstantin Rebitsev wrote a blog post called Patches Card in the Developer Seek Chains, uh, where he tries to uh, solve some of the problems with email. It's actually different problems. It's like more, let's say, technical problems with the mail itself, but yeah, the post talks about the protocol called SSBAPFS, which is kind of email in the sense that people exchange messages, except that it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, fully distributed, but it can also have servers for say, archiving and pro proxying purposes. Uh, it can work offline, 
Uh, it has strong notion of identity, trust, encryption. And the most important thing for us is that it's kind of meant for high level protocols. So it's kind of a, just a transport. So you can imagine that you can just send messages and chat with people, but you can also send a special message, which means I'm submitting a change, which has you know, your patch, your base tree, base commit, or this is the you know, next version of that change, and so on. Or say, I am, I am you know, reviewed by me, a special type of message, which will actually, which will automatically add a tag to the final commit and such things. And there's a uh, you know, company or a system called Radical, which creates a peer-to-peer -peer stack for code collaboration based on one of those protocols. And on, on the website, they have some examples which may be appealing to some of the kernel developers. So they have a uh, full common line interface where you can do, say, you know, list my patches for review or accept that patch or you know, send the change or list open issues and so on, or add a comment. So I'm not saying that we need to use exactly this. I'm just saying that something like this may potentially be a very good fit for a kernel. And obviously, a web interface for that is also possible to build. So summary, we have a number of systematic problems. And well, if we don't take any action, well, the current development process will continue to work as it is now, like nothing breaks. So. Developers may have lower productivity than they could have, and we will have you know, tens of thousands bucks per release. Security will stay low, and inflow of people will be lower. Uh, and fixing the testing, I think, will take significant time and significant amount of effort. So I propose that we take kind of more radical action for the greater benefit of the Linux kernel, kind of looking uh, at the next decades of Linux, you know, growth. Uh, so think about, for example, 10 years from now, are we still on email processes and fighting with the same pro problems? And will it happen if we just, you know, continue doing small changes with no centralization? <clears throat> so now may be the right time for changes. And that's it, thank you. Yeah, so we have a lot of, yeah, so let's thank the speaker. Uh, so we have a lot of people who I suspect are going to want to uh, make some comments, uh, and I do need to allow time for um, the follow-on speaker. Uh, so if you could try to keep your uh, questions or comments short, uh, please stand up and identify yourself. Raise your hand, I'll try to acknowledge you and try to get to people in order. Um, and uh, I'll be passing the mic around. Um. <laughs> got a laptop. I'll hold it. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, more about SysBot in terms of um, I have been. How do we update stuff? Duplicate bugs or you know a process on your end. How, what's the effective way for us to do that? Because I have tons of, a few duplicate bugs, and I'm looking at, well, I don't have a good way to update. I can't figure it out. So I was hoping to hear some of that, um, actually, from this uh, talk, but um, we can talk offline. If you could suggest one of the things you discussed here to bring up, say, at a meeting with uh, kernel maintainers that might be going on tomorrow, um, what would you suggest? If overall this is what okay. we want to do or not. Okay. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Hello, um, you mentioned me by name in there, so I wanted to chime in. Um, the, the stuff that, uh, I would love to see a lot of this stuff happen, right? The problem is that the maintainers need to be the drivers for this. I can't come to, to, to the foundation and say, this needs to happen because I say so, right? Because I'm just the sysadmin for kernel.org as far as everybody's concerned. You know, I'm just maintaining things running. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, this needs to be driven by 
people that Jim Zemlin listens to, if this is to become a Linux Foundation project, like, like Greg needs to come to Jim and say this is something that needs to definitely happen because the community is asking for it. The advisory board needs to, needs to come to Jim Zemlin and say this, this is absolutely overdue, we can't continue like this because this is a pressing problem that is breaking the kernel and it's things, if we don't change something, we're going to see things deteriorate even further and fragment and, fragment and everything. Um, and this is pretty much the only way to make this a Linux Foundation project. If we don't want to make it a Linux Foundation project, that's also possible. You can come to Microsoft and say, would you like to make yourself a big name in the Linux kernel community? You have a, make a, a team of uh, engineers and work with maintainers and see how you can um, help solve this particular problem without bringing up another web service, like centralized one. So that's kind of where I'm stand, standing and where I see the problem right now. It's not, it's not an easy fix without a drive from maintainers to make this change happen. And since maintainers are very thinly spread, they don't have enough cycles to really spend a lot of brain power on uh, figuring out where it needs to go. Uh, so have you ever heard of the, uh, the, the paper, I think it might have been extended to a book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar? I remember reading something like this, but a okay. long time ago. Yes. I, I think it might be interesting in the context of this talk because I, I think it, it basically argues the, I think what you're arguing against is the bizarre model of the kernel, which is exactly why the, like the, the author argues that's why the Linux kernel community succeeded. So it, it, it's kind of a long discussion. I don't want to like waste other people's time, but. I think that what you're describing is basically, like, you, you specifically ask for a push towards centralization, and this paper argues that the decentralized model of the kernel, this fragmentation is actually what allowed it to succeed because it allows people to have their own agendas and their own ways of doing things. That was 20 years ago, though. Yeah, literally yes. 20 years ago. Yes, as, as we figured more things that actually, you know, good ways of doing things, maybe time to promote some of the, you know, this chaos to actually one solution. So uh, there are, so there, there's the kernel CI project, which has not been formally announced yet, but a Linux Foundation project in the CI space uh, that I am hoping will be able to take on some of those bubbles that were on your, on your boxes, uh, on your slides. <clears throat> um, and there are people working on aspects of this, uh, you know, and it remains to be seen how much buy-in we'll get because, but I just want to say it's, it's not all gloom and doom. I mean, there are people who see the same problem. And it's actually refreshing to see multiple people just at this event saying basically the same thing, that we need to consolidate and unify around a couple of things. So uh, I'm hopeful that we'll make some progress in the next couple of years. So we'll see what happens. It just occurs to me that it's largely a scaling problem. If we had enough people, the bazaar model would probably still work, but we don't have enough people uh, or work working force to, to ensure that model, and so we need to think what to do. And your option, I think your option is one option, having tons of people would be another one. <laughs> Hi, Mark Rutland. Um, no, big problem is scale of communication. Throwing more people at that, you now have more communications that have to occur. That doesn't work. That's like the thing mentioned about all the trees that need to backport to. You're now throwing more people in. You lose information because someone doesn't fully understand all the intimate details of the problem they're trying to solve. The next person on loses one more detail and throwing more people it generally does not help. Time for one more uh, question or comment. All right, well, I, I will mention that uh, for file system testing in particular, I had actually tried to make the tool that I work on apply for multiple file systems. And I made an attempt to see if I could get other file system maintainers to use my tool, which in my opinion actually does a lot of things better than some of the other tools. And everybody has decided they want to do their own thing. 
So we've consolidated on XFS tests as how to actually run file system testing. I have utterly failed on making my test runner something that more people are willing to use. Uh, and the only approach I've been able to use is I'm trying to get some interns to add, you know, automatic kernel building and bisection and try to add enough features that it is so much more powerful than the other tools that it can generate the attractive force to make it be successful. Uh, and I'm trying to do that on volunteer labor because, you know, it's a lot easier that way. <laughs> Yeah, this is the thing, we, we have, it's, it's so much fragmented that no single testing effort can get enough resources to actually right. pass the bar of being really, yeah. you know, It sounds like you're useful. doing the same thing that like seven of the CI systems are doing, which is add, adding bisection to make it attractive enough to, so I mean, it's, it, that's a manifestation of the problem, right? And if there was a really, really good bisect tool, which there was a talk on yesterday, uh, you wouldn't have to do that, right? So we could all specialize if, if we could make a, a modular ecosystem. Yeah, and I think the issue is, is that none of the existing tools did the one thing I needed for file system testing, and so I was forced to generate my own infrastructure, and that's been the yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> But I think to Dimitri's point, what he's suggesting basically that instead of each of us getting a bunch of interns and people trying to make your system better, we pull those people into this big um, worker pool to make the community better in general instead of competing with each other you know, or trying to compete. Yeah. yeah, let's make this the last comment. I want to make sure there's enough uh, room for the next talk. Um, so I think we all agree that everything should be better. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we agree that we need Linus to buy in and blah, blah, blah. But you've got to have a really concrete proposal. Like what, what exactly should we be switching to? Like what's the, we have to take some pain to get to the next local mm -hmm. maxima, but what is it? So we need concrete proposal, but I'm sure that it should not be only me who will, you know, create all of this proposal with all of the details, right? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> so, and ju just creating this proposal is lots of work, right? So it, even that will require kind of a working group to, you know, figure out just, you know, so, very so high there, level things. There is an automated testing working group, so believe it or not. And there's a conference call every month that involves a bunch of people from a bunch of different CI systems. And I would argue that if, if you want to see automated testing, Part, portion of this all, please get on the conference call, please get on the mailing list, and communicate with the other people that are working on this. But I mean, you're not, he's not just talking about testing, he's talking about yeah, submission I, and the whole I'm thing. Yeah. Yeah. Testing, so. yeah. How, how do you get, how do you get patches to ch test and how do you send results, for example, kernel, kernel say I can do this and it's kind of a hard problem, but it's not solely on the testing, you know, area. Yeah, so I'm afraid we probably could keep on going for the rest of the day. Uh, so let's thank Dimitri, and this conversation will continue. So. Um. <laughs>